I think that's about right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Wood Lane Hall in Sorby, West Yorkshire, a couple of miles west of Halifax, there's an impressive porch which commemorates the date of its construction, 1649, and the man who had the hall built, John Dearden. He was of a family that had grown very prosperous in the textile trade of Halifax and the South Pennines in the four or five generations over which it had developed a national profile. Around the house, on uh, window and door mouldings, finials, truffling ends, downpipes, typical locations, there are a host of other carvings, mostly carved faces which are clearly <coughs> not intended to be of Dearden. Some sideways heart or arrow shapes, which are known locally as devil's arrows, and a string of corbel ends marking the, the good life of the nouveau riche of yeomen and aspirant gentry, smoking, hunting, fleecy sheep, and the insignia of the Stuart dynasty. <coughs> On the date stone, too, alongside initials, there is a carved head, pear shaped flat relief, but sporting a beard and long wavy hair. Presumably this is a rough likeness of John Dearden with the facial and head hair styles of the period, but it isn't quite a portrait. It could be any well-to-do male of his generation. Barely a foot or two above the date stone, below the horizontal stone frame of the outer design, is another carved head, markedly different in character from the quasi-portrait below it, and a lot cruder than the other face carvings on the mouldings. This couldn't be described even as a quasi-portrait. No one who had commissioned it as an act of personal display would, I think, be liable to pay the mason for the work. It may possibly have come from an earlier provenance somewhere and incorporated into the new hall, but the present house was the first stone one built on the site, and in any case, this doesn't negate the implications I should draw today. It isn't a part of the house's overall ornamental scheme, and it does no justice to the pomp of the porch itself. Still, both builder and patron evidently approved its prominent location over the front door. Its choice and location are evidently deliberate. Now, all across this area of West Yorkshire, around about the first half of the 17th century, affluent clothiers were rebuilding their houses in stone. The aggrandised farmhouses and aspirant halls used traditional local building styles, frequently including symbols and designs, and are classic examples of vernacular architecture. They came at something of a cusp in British social history, the ascendancy of strict Protestantism against a background of traditional, traditional government, and uh, with more than a smattering of the values that became mercantile capitalism. The new thinking vied with older traditions and beliefs. In the Pennine area outside Halifax Parish, the great rebuilding came slightly later in the century and embellishments at doors, windows, gables and so on are markedly fewer. By happy chance, here in this part of West Yorkshire, we have a wealth of evidently customary protective signs and symbols preserved in stone, a vernacular style called looking backwards and forwards. Now the building of these impressive Halifax houses, as they came to be known, set them apart from their less affluent neighbours in a local culture where showing off one's wealth was, or at least had been, not the <coughs> dumb thing. It's a situation where we might expect envy to be aroused and to be expressed toxically via what we know as the evil eye. Not, of course, a witch's malice necessarily, but a rather standard negative emotion which exists within every one of us, albeit expressed more bitterly and powerfully by some than others. These families then, visibly better off than their neighbours, but not yet gentry, knew they needed protection, and there were measures they could employ against unseen attack. Now, in a restored farmhouse about three miles away from Wood Lane Hall, a 14-foot beam, estimated to date from perhaps the late 14th century, 
has been incorporated into a family home. Now, when I first saw this thing, I had the feeling that I was staring at a medieval, late medieval, comprehensive insurance policy. Along its length, as you see, are these variety of protective symbols that I'm sure most of us here will be familiar with. You've got the sacred monogram, the tree of life, pentagram, variations on the diagonal cross, the god's eye, and more, including a carved face. Very crude and basic, looking like nobody on earth, or at least nobody who particularly relish looking like that, at least. Ranged alongside the other protective devices, one can assume function by association. This is a face to ward away misfortune and malice, and it's an example of what John Castillo, an early 19th century builder, stonemason, dialect poet and head carver of the Cleveland district of North Yorkshire, called Taubman's Fierce. What I've turned generically, and to make it a lot easier to pronounce, the archaic head. Now the archaic head can be generalised as a minimalist depiction of the human head, typically featuring only eyes, nose and mouth frequently with the eyebrows and nose conjoined in a T-shape. Ears are optional and barely developed, the face typically pear-shaped and executed in flat relief. It's neither a fully human face nor a skull, though it stands within the artistic spectrum between them. The old man's face and the archaic head are characterised by the same thing, a studied avoidance of realism. The crude head on Wood Lane Hall made no pretense at the likeness of John Deere, or at least we hope not. And the face on the beam, too, isn't really Mr. Darcy. These things, though, were made to adorn the outside of relatively grand buildings. And you might expect an appearance to assist their owner's demand for status and their claim to refinement. Yet they shun the aspirant display that's clearly apparent in the later preference for carved heads with noble, even classical features. There is thus a dissonance in, vis in visual form, and today I'd like to suggest a way by which this may be understood. Now the crucial difference between concealed and visible protective devices surely is visibility. With a concealed item, some esoteric chemistry between the object, the deposition and the depositor or depositors is presumably the means by which to effect the desired result. No one else's perception or witness is required. With visible, visible items, however, the implication is that witness is required. Not only is the device doing its work, or so it's hoped, but it needs to be seen to be doing its work. Its appearance must display visual cues that impart sense and meaning. The archaic head is part of a long established esoteric and apotropaic tradition associated with liminal situations over a wide geographic area. Its backstory appears to stretch into prehistory, where it encompasses stylized carvings of various kinds, including the <coughs> minimalistic archaic form and human skulls themselves. And the motif of what the French call the tête coupée, the severed head, has been a recurrent feature of archaeology, folk narrative and architecture in the historical period too. In the Middle Ages particularly, a side branch explored stylization as seen in ecclesiastical grotesques, but the main bearer of the motif in secular contexts was the simple archaic form, reaching something of an apogee in 17th century Britain, especially, it appears, in West Yorkshire. Now, carvings of the human head have remained in vogue over doorways in particular in recent centuries, but more recently, while still coupe, they are, still, they are rather different in character, in that they take on a more naturalistic or classical portrait form. The preferred modern mask is noble, aspirational, a far cry from the archaic form. It is more attractive in itself, and hence it is a decorative addition. It's also the kind of face we might very well see on an individual in the street, 
which cannot generally be said of the archaic type of face. This is exactly what the archaic head is not. The dual heads at Wood Lane Hall seem to anticipate this shift from the archaic to the portrait. The lower head approximating to contemporary gentlemen, the upper head, like all archaic heads, caught between the living visage and the post-mortem skull. Fieldwork also indicates that while archaic heads are sometimes folklorically associated with alleged deaths during construction, more commonly with the protection of the home from malignity, no such folklore is attached to the more naturalistic heads. No one's told me, at least, that a head that is supposed to look like so-and-so, unless it actually does look a bit like a person. And similarly, no one has told me that a portrait head, their portrait head over the door, is supposed to ward off bad luck. So, similar apotropaic powers are alleged for certain variants of the church grotesque as well. That indicates that folklore and tradition seem to prefer their protective heads to be anything but realistic. Perhaps that was what the builder of Wood Lane Hall was thinking when he inserted or prevailed upon Mr. Dearden to have inserted the archaic head above the quasi-portrait on the date stone. The implication here, as in every archaic head or stylized grotesque, seems to be to do the job of averting the evil eye or witchcraft or any other demonic threat. It was necessary for the head not to look like anyone in this everyday reality. If it should look like someone in this world, then it loses its power, it loses its essential liminality. That's the key visual cue. So the first thing the archaic head dispenses with is extravagant fleshiness. Also, typically, but not invariably, any hairstyle on the face or head is eschewed. Ears, too, retreat back to basics. The archaic head is the living head excarnating before our eyes in order to deal with its own liminal agency. It clearly isn't a living being, it's not one of this world, yet it's not one of the dead either. It is not a skull, though the features, eyes, brow ridges, nose and mouth are those that remain to view on the defleshed skull. The archaic head, in other words, removes life but doesn't embrace death. It passed, pauses the mask midway. The deliberate evasion of portraiture begs the question, why? Well, perhaps it makes enough intuitive sense on its own, but I'd like to suggest a possible rationale for this long-standing visual settlement of a face apparently settled, apparently poised on the threshold, neither here nor there. Now, in December 1995, a Sheffield man was driving along a road in the Peak District, arguing with his stepfather, but he felt he wasn't being listened to. His stepfather wasn't, he wasn't being given the opportunity to have his say. So he pulled over into a lay-by and stabbed his stepfather to death. That doesn't concern us here. What does concern us is that he then dragged the body out of the car and cut off his head with a Japanese sword, which he happened to have with him. Whether we knew that the lay-by was at a place known from a legendary historical event as Cutthroat Bridge is a kind of psychogeographic avenue we can't really go into. But he told that it was all told the court, because of course that's where he ended up, that's where we know of this thing, that it was all a spur of the moment thing. <laughs> and he told the court that he'd heard that the brain remained conscious for 20 minutes after decapitation. In other words, enough time for him to be able to put his point across to his stepdad and for his stepdad to hear and understand that point while helpfully being unable to interrupt. <laughs> so he put the man's body in the boot, the head in the passenger seat, drove off and he talked to it for 20 minutes until the inevitable happened. Um, now this I th is, I think, an astonishing modern instance of a very familiar trope, that the head remains conscious after it's been cut off. 
Celtic narratives feature this notion frequently, as do later tales and testimonies. There's an 18th century anecdote from the Halifax gibbet, which was, by the way, a, a guillotine method unique in Britain. So not only was Halifax putting these severed heads up in its houses, it was also chopping them off from the 13th to 17th century as well, just for fun. And this anecdote attests to uh, the, the continuing uh, life in the skull after decapitation. And witnesses at the Paris guillotine at the end of that century noted how the Queen's lips continued to move as if in prayer as her head flopped down to the basket. Several instances were noted where the victim's eyes widened as they looked at the crowd as they fell. And uh, Charlotte de Corday, Marat's assassin in 1793, was said to have scowled when a man picked up a severed head and tweaked it on the cheek. 20 minutes is pushing it though. Current scientific opinion put survival of consciousness in the severed head at between 6 and 12 seconds, which I think you probably agree with me, is probably still long enough to be quite upsetting. So a persistent perception, and apparently scientifically confirmed, is that when the head is severed, the person is to all intents and purposes dead, but life and consciousness remain. The liminal point between life and death is extended, as is awareness. The implication, it seems to me, both symbolic and actual, and especially to those who watch the severed heads mouth something at them, probably the contemporary French equivalent of OMG, <laughs> as they fell into the uh, basket, is that for a certain period of time, the severed head can perceive both this world and the next simultaneously. So is this the key to the archaic head's typology? This is a head that's caught between states, asked to protect the goods and the persons of this world while gazing into some other dimension to address any malevolent presence or influence that might erupt into this place or into this family's everyday reality. Some stylization is needed to indicate differentiation from this world, but not so much stylization as to denote final separation. This way it can deliver the visual message. This is the visual cue, as I say, and it takes the role of a guardian in this cue at the threshold between the human and the extra human dimension. So perhaps in 1649, a Halifax builder said something like this. Now then, Mr. Dean, putting a head above your door is all well and good, but if you want it to work for you, like all the people you employ, Yours is much too handsome. You want a face that's a bit different from yours and mine. You want the old man's face up there, you do. And since builders knew what they were doing, and their houses are still standing 450 years later, they reached a compromise and put them both up to be perhaps an object lesson in the subtleties of symbolism. I know of an instance of something that looks very much like your archaic head. It's unfortunately undateable. It's just a carving. It's on a. It, well, it's described as being in a cage, but in fact, it's on the side of a very large boulder, sheltered by another um, boulder, about a mile north of Western Superman. And it occurs to me from hearing what you've just been saying about the threshold thing that it is exactly on the liminal boundary between land and sea. Mm. Yeah, we, I mean, we find these arcane okay, heads deployed all kinds of boundaries, yes. Yeah, but there's, there there, are there's cave absolutely, entrances, nothing, no, yeah, there's there's absolutely nothing, else. nothing else in the yeah. area except this one head. Yeah. 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 So, do you, is that it? That's no, I'd like, say yeah. that, that, <laughs> that it is, you know, as you say, in yeah. the, on the boundary. Yeah. yeah. And there's hand raised up there too. Do you think there's any connection between uh, the display of seven, actual seven human heads? Yes. Yeah. yeah quite definitely. Um, but there comes a point, uh, there came a point when that was um, <laughs> ethically unacceptable, except, for, of course, for traitors' heads in, uh, in London or in York and so on. 
but uh, you'll notice that the the severed heads were typically placed to gateways again. Mm. The one of the prime denoters of the archaic head of the severed head motif is not so much what it looks like as where it is. And as Graham said, it that's what you're looking at. It's at a threshold of of some kind. Um, so you even find that basic uh, de what's a de-lifed visage on certain swords, for instance, mortuary swords. Mm. Um, again, it's another liminal location, another location between life and death. So yes, very much so. There is uh, the, the the skull, perhaps to be seen. I don't. I'm not trying to try to guess for prehistory, but yes. John? There, there's a recurrent place name type uh, which usually appears as hue stock, uh, mm. which is Old English hairbird stock. Yeah. And the two hue stocks in Dorset, one is at the entrance of the town of Wareham, which is a kind of classic ritualised square walled town. Uh, the other is at the entrance to Sturminster New. And in both cases, the unfortunates of both towns were clearly having their, their own, you know, you couldn't afford a gateway, so this is like an early Anglo Saxon. Um, but they're having stakes put up uh, with a head facing you as you came in. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? Yeah, the whole, the whole idea of... Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not into this folk revival thing, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not one we will seek to... But um, I've been talking to a couple of people today about the, the Sainsbury's Centre up there, and there are some exhibits hmm. there of... Uh, figureheads, as it were, displayed on stakes. Mm. So, and it's an interesting point that the Sainsbury's Centre kind of underlines the widespread nature of this motif worldwide as a protective agency. So, recommend it if anybody's going. I've seen similar things around court bells and around churches. Yeah. How common is it in that context, do you think? Very, mm -hmm. very. Yeah. Uh, in churches, of corbels, doorways, and chancel arches are the most common that I can think of. I've had. So conforming to the same norms, basically. Mm -hmm. Conforming to the same yes, norms. Same norms norm, the yes, same norms. Yes. I mean, because of course, um, <coughs> the, the chancel arch in particular is, is on top of the arch. It's also typically raised, mm -hmm. you know, which is another liminal signifier. If you're moving into another world, that's when you need to start protecting. Mm -hmm. so. What? Okay, it's gone quiet. Is there somebody out there? Good. Have you seen any that are uh, movable or portable? Have I seen uh, any? Sorry. Any uh, archaic heads that have a kind of shaft at the back where it's inserted into the wall? Um, not a shaft at the back. There are a number of archaic heads that are flat at the back, where they've been inserted into a recess. Yeah, which is the equivalent. Yes, I'm familiar with one in Ireland. It was actually stolen. It, could, it was taken out of a wall of a church. Uh, it was believed to have sent um, a pre-Christian god, from Dove. You're talking about from Dove, yeah. Yes. Uh, from Cohen, yeah. Yeah, from that one was stolen. Yes. yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As far as I understood, that that was inserted into the water and could be taken out. And that's how it was so easily removed. Yes, yeah. Uh, I've alarmingly come that across... They were portable so and could be used. Yeah. yeah, I've come across a lot of portable. You never know whether they're intended to be portable yes. or whether they've just come from somewhere else, somebody's made them, put them somewhere, and they've ended up in, the, in this or that location. Um, <laughs> yeah, you never quite know whether they're supposed to be portable. There are um, Jacobean plaster ceilings. There are often sort of monster faces, but mm. they're not quite the same. They're not impassive. They're more um, uh, challenging. To mm. you. Would they be? I, I would put them in uh, to the same sort of area mm. as the ecclesiastical grotesques, but with a bit more of a decorative. Intent, with a lot more decorative intent, in fact. Uh, the plaster scenes were, were there, to my mind, to be mostly decorative, yeah. but they, they seem to come from a tradition which also embraces the grotesque. Mm -hmm. But 
that, I think, as I say, I think it's a side, side branch which needs a lot more detailed investigation. Yes, because um, and I, I think there's water sites, we kind of call them, wells are one of them. There's, there's one in Hebden Bridge, where I came from, which, it come from it's on, which is on a, an aqueduct. So that seems to have a relationship to it as well. And um, the way I kind of think of water sites as being liberal, I mean, I don't know whether this makes sense to any of one else here, but the idea of parallax, um, when you stick a stick into, into water, mm. it bends, doesn't it? So the, when you look through water, the, the world looks pretty much the same as this one, but it's a bit different. Mm. So that strikes me as being a, a kind of key, one of what I was talking about, the visual cues, as one of the key visual cue for water as a liminal threshold. Step through it, who knows where you are, might meet a mermaid. Or Neptune. This is what I'm thinking. Yes, certainly, certainly wells are a feature. And of course, you've got the saints' wells as well, which are associated with heads. Lots of legends about St. Winifred's well, for instance, in Holywell. Um, a lot of Cornish saints and Breton saints have got seven heads associated with well founding. So there's very strong thread there, yeah. The well and head link is slightly more complicated than that. Yeah. I think that wells with heads have acquired a reputation later. Most holy wells, medieval holy wells, have tended not to have heads. But you, you've got lots of things like the Slavering Babby, um, and you've actually got the, the, um, the Welsh um, St Anne's well, I think, at Trellis, which became a spa and then became a holy well. Um, yeah, I'll take that one, but that is certainly true. I think yeah. that those are the, the legends probably came before. But also, interesting, yeah. the archaism of the heads develops, because the, the one example which is the Holy Well first is um, St Oswald's at Oswestry, um, which had a, um, an accurately carved head put in by somebody, probably 18th century, um, which was then reduced to an archaic head by kids throwing stones at it. <laughs> Um, and an awful lot of these have some tradition where you're allowed to batter the head, uh, which is almost as if you're beating the portraiture out of it. Uh, the same occurs because you get a lot of lion spout wells, which have been treated in the same way, and it's a classical motif, which has been taken by people as something that needs to be reduced to something a bit more elemental. Mm. You've just put John Castillo's poem into my head there. Mm. Uh, one of his dialect poet was, there is some unlucky lads that once corrected me, their dads, they could be in some better plea than throwing stones at an old man's face. But that suggests, he doesn't like being mm. kids throwing stones at a carved head. Um, yet, it's tempting to do so. Mm. Um, I, 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 <coughs> you'll know the Corlec, three-faced Corlec head, aren't you? It's found at the base of a standing stone. Uh, in Ireland, it's now in the Dublin Museum, and it's quite battered, isn't it? And the, the standing stone in the field where it was found was a fairground, and I can't get over the feeling that maybe that head had become, at some point, a an Aunt Sally head. Mm. So, uh, and I, I know I've upset a couple of people in Ireland by saying that. But <laughs> Okay, I think. Have we got another one? Yeah. Yeah. Good. You began, or oh, quite near the beginning, you mentioned 1649, mm. the year Charles I was executed. Yeah. Is there any connection? Uh, there's a little bit of a. With that picture there, um, there's a little bit of a connection between these yeoman. Asper and Yeoman are uh, putting their colours to the mask. So they're, they're showing this typical gentleman's face, which is also King Charles' face. And uh, 
around the side of Wood Lane Hall, as I say, you've got the insignia of the Stuart dynasty. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're signifying the support from more or less overtly. If you go to Keithley, to East Riddleston Hall, uh, there's another similar face, paused between an archaic and a, and a portrait. And underneath it, rather tellingly, you've got Vive Le Roy. <laughs> so, so yes, there is. And there's another side of it which comes out. Uh, mortuary chairs are said to be support, to indicate support for the monarchy, for the Stuart dynasty. But Probably when you look at them, they're classic. Okay. Well. So yeah. there were things you could hang around your neck. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it's one of those cases where, where the symbol is being put to double use. Multivalency of simple. It was useful at the time. I think I'm going to step down now. Right, John. <laughs>